Okay, so good afternoon. We're going to start talking about DNA today. Uh, you can see this lecture here is a little bit about the introduction, uh, there's a little bit of history here, and a little bit about DNA structure. Uh, what I want to do is actually just draw attention to my tie. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about my necktie here in a few minutes, but uh, let's just get on to the lecture and uh, we'll come back to my tie because it's fun having a DNA tie. Okay, so see a couple other people joining. Let me just add them and uh, we'll get going on a lecture. There we go. Okay, so let's talk about DNA today. Uh, you've probably heard uh, about Mendel. And so that was a while ago. And uh, Mendel, of course, counted his P's and we learned a little bit about uh, uh, genetics back in the day. And uh, he had talked about what a, what a gene is. And, uh, you know, he didn't really understand, any, you know, any of the molecules behind it, right? And so uh, we're not going to talk about kind of classical genetics. What we want to talk about is molecular biology, where we're talking about DNA and chemistry and those kind of things. So DNA as a molecule was uh, somewhat discovered in the late 1800s uh, when some chemists were starting to realize there's something in the nucleus, and they called it nucleon. They didn't know what it was made of. Um, here's kind of a really gross fact for you. This guy here, Frederick Meissner, uh, he was collecting white blood cells because they have large nucleuses or nuclei, and that's where he was getting his DNA from. And where do you get white blood cells from? Well, you get them from pus. So he was literally going to the hospital and collecting old bandages, uh, the ones with lots of pus in order to do his research. Really gross, but uh, I guess it worked. So uh, late 1800s, Early 1900s, chemists are starting to kind of understand a few things in general. Uh, we kind of had a, a word for nucleic acid. They were acidic things found in nucleuses. And we found that nuclein had uh, also protein involved in it. And there may have been some RNA in there as well. And so uh, people were starting to come up with hypotheses about the molecules, RNA and proteins and DNA in terms of what they are. And uh, so this brings us to the uh, early 1900s. And uh, somebody was studying bacteria. And so this is a slide I showed you way, way back in topic five on glycocalyx. So remember we talked about we have capsules and we have slime layers. These are carbohydrates that are found on bacterial cells and they're allowing them to evade the immune system. So immune cells try to grab on and these things are kind of slimy and slippery. And so they help to make these things pathogenic. So the species he was looking at was a streptococcus. Uh, I don't know if it was the same one that caused um, strep throat. I think it was the one that causes pneumonia. Uh, yeah, there it is, streptococcus pneumonia. And uh, so it turns out there were two types of this. Uh, so there was uh, these smooth ones and these rough ones. And, and, and they were called smooth and rough because that's what they looked like on a Petri dish. So we've looked at colonies on Petri dish in this class, right? And, and uh, the smooth ones, they just, they look smoother and, and uh, looser, and uh, they were in fact goopier. So it turns out that these smooth ones have a capsule, and uh, the rough ones did not. So two different genetic uh, variants of uh, the streptococcus. So it turns out that if you took a bunch of the streptococcus, and if you inject it in mice, um, if you injected the rough ones, the mice are fine, the immune system can clear it out, if you inject the smooth ones with the capsule, they're pathogenic and they will kill the mouse. So um, this is kind of uh, an important part of his experiment. So 1928, here's what he did. Uh, I just mentioned this, you put the uh, S ones in a mouse, the mouse dies. You put the R ones in a mouse, the mouse is healthy. So the S ones, remember, have the capsule. So then the next part of experiment uh, is, well, he killed the S cells. So he killed the bacteria just by a little bit of heat and uh, you inject them in the mouse and the mouth is fine. So hopefully that makes sense. The pathogen is dead, the pathogen can't kill the mouse. But here's the interesting part of his experiment is that uh, he took the dead, killed S cells, mixed them with the R cells, injected them into the mice and the mice died. And then when he uh, isolated pathogens from the mice, he found living S cells. So he said that, hey, these things were transformed the R cells were transformed into S cells. So this was kind of his conclusion. There was some sort of transforming factor or variable. He, he didn't really know what it was, 1928. 
So lots of people kind of looked at this study and thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Probably has something to do with genetics, maybe the genes. And of course, you know, at the time, people were arguing about what genes were actually made of. So this brings us uh, a few years later, 1940. Um, this is the lab of Oswald Avery, and there's a Canadian in there. So it's always exciting to see Canadian scientists making their mark, Colin McLeod. And then this other guy, uh, Macklin McCartney, which I think was actually American, but actually uh, lived in Canada for a while too. So that's kind of cool. And uh, I love these photos of scientists in black and white. Usually they're very serious, but I found one of Avery at a Christmas party. It looks like there's a little something in the punch. So they wanted to test what that transforming factor was. And so this is kind of what they did, right? Uh, most people were thinking proteins or DNA. In fact, a lot of people were thinking proteins at the time. Proteins are very complex. Uh, there's 20 amino acids. Uh, it just seems to make sense that maybe a protein would actually have information built into it. Whereas DNA and RNA, there's only four nucleotides. It just doesn't seem as complex. But, you know, there were, there were arguments either way. And uh, so what they did is, is they, you know, used some chemistry and they uh, used some methods to extract the different macromolecules. So they extracted proteins, they extracted RNA, DNA, carbohydrates, lipids, right? And they mixed these one by one with the R strains. And the question is, okay, which one of these is going to make it into the pathogenic S strain? And the answer was the DNA. So this was a landmark study, right? Where uh, not everyone was convinced because of course, there's always the question about how careful these guys are. Are, any of them, are they sloppy chemists, those kind of things. And some people just, you know, they're in their protein camp so hard, it's hard to move out when, when the scientific evidence uh, s suggests otherwise. Uh, but yeah, so, so they had done this experiment and a lot of people were like, wow, DNA. Wow, what do we know about DNA? Not much, do we? Um, so lots of people were suddenly very interested in DNA, wanting to unravel all of its secrets. Uh, but before we get to DNA, I just want to talk about one more experiment that kind of, uh, you know, show that DNA was indeed the genetic material. So this uh, is Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, um, not the chocolate bar Hershey, but a different guy. And uh, they were working with viruses and they had some interesting findings. So the viruses they were working with are called bacteriophage. So you can see there's that word there, bacteriophage. So that means bacteria and phage means eating, just like uh, phagocytosis, right? So this literally means eaters of bacteria. So these are little uh, viruses. You can see they kind of look like lunar landers. And we're going to talk about them uh, when we talk about viruses. But one thing to know is the virus only has two different types of macromolecules. It's made of only proteins and it's made of only nucleic acids. There's no carbohydrates or lipids or anything like that. So that is, that is it, right? And uh, so here's the experiment that they did is they used uh, radioactive chemicals. So they used isotopes of sulfur and isotope of phosphate. So really they did two experiments, right? So you can see this first experiment, they're using an isotope of sulfur, uh, radioactive sulfur 35, and uh, sulfur is found in amino acids. Not all the amino acids, just two of them, methionine and uh, cysteine, but it's enough and it also is not found at all in DNA. So what you have here now is radioactive proteins and non-radioactive DNA, right, uh, in, in the viruses. So what you do is you, uh, you take the viruses, you infect some E. coli, and, uh, and then what you do is you, you shake it up a bunch. You can see it looks like they're using a blender. And then you put it into a centrifuge and you get a little pellet. And so the viruses are too small to end up in the pellet, right? And so whatever the viruses is putting in, into the E. coli, uh, should be in the pellet. So when they looked at this, they found the radioactive material was in the solution, was in the supernatant, and in the pellets, they were non-radioactive. So this seems to suggest that, uh, you know, the proteins are not getting into the E. coli at all. So they did a parallel experiment, right? Uh, you can't just stop here. This is just sort of, you know, the beginning of the whole thing. The second experiment, they used radioactive phosphorus, phosphorus 32. This stuff is really nasty. I used to work with it years ago. Um, it just gets everywhere. So this is found in DNA. And um, so same kind of experiment. You label your DNA uh, with the radioactive isotope, uh, but the proteins are not uh, radioactive, right? So same kind of experiment. You infect E. coli, you shake it up for a bit, you put it in a centrifuge. And if the DNA is getting into the E. coli, then the DNA is going to end up in the pellet. So there it is. 
the DNA ended up in coli. So the DNA must be the virus instructions. That was kind of the, uh, the rationale here. So here's kind of the summary of the, of the whole experiment. So this was kind of, you know, you had, you had those other guys, Avery and McCartney and Cloud, and now you have Hershey and Chase. And so you end up with all this, uh, all this evidence that says, okay, DNA is definitely the genetic material. And so scientists all over the world uh, wanted to figure out DNA and, and everybody knew whoever figured it out, uh, you know, they were gonna be famous big time and it would be a very significant finding. And of course it has been, uh, you know, a huge, uh, think about all the technologies that use DNA and all our understanding of biology uh, in the past 50 years. Uh, this is very huge. So let's talk a little bit about what we did know about DNA at the time and what we know now. I wanna talk about some chemistry now. And, uh, and then we're, I want to talk about the three-dimensional structure of the double helix as well. So um, we talked about this a little bit already, uh, that uh, um, DNA and RNA, of course, are nucleotides. And nucleotides are made of nucleic acids, and nucleic acids have three parts. So they have, they have a phosphate group, they have a nitrogenous base, and they have a sugar right here. So uh, this particular nucleic acid is a uh, deoxy nucleic acid because um, it's missing an oxygen. If this was RNA, there would be a little oxygen like right here. And uh, so this one is, uh, is a DNA nucleotide. And um, yeah, so let's take a look at these structures and uh, I'll show you a couple of things about them. So these nitrogenous bases, there's, uh, there's actually more than four. You probably know that uracil is a nitrogenous base. Uh, found in RNA, but we're just talking about DNA today, so let's not worry about RNA so much uh, so far. Uh, there are other nitrogen spaces out there. Um, you may or may not know that caffeine is a nitrogen space. It looks a lot like adenine, uh, just slightly different. Uh, but these are the ones we care about. These are the ones found in DNA. So we're going to focus on them today. Why are they called nitrogenous? Because look at all those nitrogens. Um, so nitrogenous, just describing these things. So you have um, the single ring structures, which are pyrimidines, and you've got the double ring structures, which are purines. Um, and I always get those mixed up because I feel like the shorter word should be with the smaller structure and the longer, but it's the other way around, right? So we have uh, cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. So usually uh, abbreviated as just the one letter codes, the C, T, A, or G. So once we start putting these things together, you can get nucleosides or nucleotides. So you can see the difference, a nucleoside is the sugar plus the base. A nucleotide is the sugar plus the base plus a phosphate. So if you have a phosphate, you're nucleotide, if you don't, you're nucleoside. So you can see there's some examples there. There's a DNA nucleoside and an RNA nucleoside, no phosphate. And then we have a DNA nucleotide, which has a phosphate. Now, some of these have special names. You can see um, if we have uh, adenine plus ribose, uh, it has a special name, which is adenosine. And I'm pointing that out because you've seen that before in ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? So adenosine, you know, um, is the name where we have the, uh, uh, the sugar attached to the base. Some of these have special names. Uh, there's a whole bunch there. You can see there's a chart that has all the names and, uh, you know, they're often given little abbreviations. Uh, you know, sometimes the one letter code, uh, sometimes we're trying to, uh, you know, communicate how many phosphates we have. So do we have a TP, a DP, or a MP, right? Or we could have CTP or UTP. So lots of different possibilities. We can also have deoxy ones. So the DNA version, so D, ATP, or D, DTP, and so on. So you can see all the different uh, possibilities there in that chart. So let's talk about the structure of the DNA strand. And so this was something that was known uh, in the early 1950s. Um, they didn't quite understand everything about it, um, but they, they, they were pretty sure this was how it was put together uh, for the most part. There were some, some arguments about some of the particularities about the uh, nitrogen spaces, and um, those were figured out by Watson and Crick eventually, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but you can see there, there's a strand of DNA and you can see we have uh, one nucleotide, the nucleotide consisting of the, um, the nucleotide consisting of the phosphate and sugar backbone, and then the uh, nitrogenous bases there on the right-hand side. So uh, I think we talked about this way back, 
Uh, we talk, call this a phospho diester linkages. So way back when we were talking about macromolecules, I threw that. I think I threw that word down. I'm pretty sure I did. And uh, so if you know what an ester linkage is, if you take some organic chemistry, this is a phosphodiester linkage. Uh, so a little bit of chemistry there for you. So there's ATP, ADP, AMP, adenosine. Okay, so some things to keep in mind, right? When you see these structures, and uh, as we talk about uh, as we talk about DNA um, over the next uh, couple of weeks, there's lots uh, uh, lots to talk about here. So it's important to know a little bit about these structures. Okay, so early 1950s, we had uh, Hershey and Chase, and we had a bunch of other people doing some interesting things. Um, this guy uh, came along. Uh, he published in 1950. Uh, I think he was an American. Um, I thought he was working in Canada. I wonder if he had a Canadian connection too. I really can't quite remember. Uh, so what he was doing is he was looking at DNA in different organisms and uh, he found uh, some interesting things. And so he found that the proportions of the purines and the portion, proportions of the pyrimidines were always the same. So, so what does that mean, right? For example, if we had an organism with 15% adenine, um, then it also had 15% thymine. And then what's left over, so 15 plus 15 is, is, uh, is 30, of course, so what's left over is 70%. And so the cytosine and the guanine were also equivalent. So this was uh, uh, called Chargas rules. And um, people were thinking, what, what does this mean? This is like a mystery. We, we have, uh, you know, there's a piece of a puzzle here. And it's not the same for every organism. Not every organism has 15 and 15 for A and T. Um, it was different throughout the organisms, but within one organism, all the pyrimidines added up to 50% 50, 50 and all the purines added up to 50%. So like I said, this was one of these mysteries and people who were thinking about DNA were kind of, this is in the back of their mind, kind of wondering, um, you know, what is, what is going on here? So like I said, uh, known as Chargas rule, lots of people were thinking about it. And uh, this picture, you know, kind of makes it nice. I'm going to come back to this because maybe you know what's going on here with the A and the T and the C and the G thing. So uh, something else that was going on, like I said, there were lots of groups kind of working on DNA. And uh, this was uh, one of the groups working on DNA was uh, a man named uh, Maurice Wilkins. And uh, someone working in his lab, a collaborator was Rosalind Franklin. Um, this was at, um, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of the place now. Uh, is it King's College? This was in London, England, anyway. And uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin was a worldwide expert in something called X-ray crystallography. So it's worth it just to mention what X-ray crystallography is. Uh, it's a very complicated technique. And uh, what you do is you shine X-rays at a crystal. So why x-rays? Well, um, if you've ever taken physics and you've, and you've learned about those diffraction experiments, uh, this is kind of what you're doing is the x-rays, the wavelength of an x-ray is very similar to the size of an atom. And so what that means is the wavelength of the x-ray can interact with the atom. And so if you have a crystal there, um, why a crystal? Because all the atoms are in the same orientation. So to hit the crystal, and, uh, and then you, you end up with uh, what is called a diffraction pattern. Right? So the x-rays bounce in kind of a predictable mathematical way. Uh, and the math is very, very complex. Uh, nowadays, we have computers to sort this stuff out. Uh, and uh, uh, back then, they did not. So this was really hard grunt work. And uh, you know, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of things about this technology that make it very difficult. Sometimes people, I, I used to um, have a professor, and he was working on this, and it took him I think he spent four years trying to make crystals of a protein. <laughs> so you can imagine that uh, he was doing other things at the time, but uh, he never was successful. And so couldn't quite do this kind of experiment. So part of it was growing the crystals, part of it was uh, using instruments. And back then this, this technology was very primitive. Um, so to get good images like this one here, this is Rosalind's fam uh, famous image, uh, you know, um, it really took people with a lot of skill. So she was working on this and uh, trying to understand the structure of DNA. And you can see my comment there. She almost had the answer. Uh, you know, um, it depends on who you talk to, right? Uh, she was wrong about some things. She definitely was. 
uh, but she was an expert on DNA. And she was working on this and getting some very beautiful pictures, but she, there were some things she didn't quite understand. Okay, so enter Watson and Crick. So Watson and Crick were at Cambridge University in England. And um, these guys, I, uh, you know, I can't even remember what they were working on. I think, um, I think Crick was working on uh, viruses or something uh, in plants and Watson was working on like the viscosity of liquids. And uh, these guys were super bored with their projects and uh, they were obsessed with DNA. Like they were really obsessed with DNA. They, they shared an office together and they would go to the office and talk about DNA and they would talk about DNA and that's all they did. They would go to the bar and talk about DNA. They would, they would uh, you know, um, Crick uh, was married at the time and Watson would go to Crick's house and they would sit in the living room talking about DNA. These guys were obsessed. And uh, something that they started to do, I'll show you a picture here. I'll come back to that in a second. They started making models. Uh, that's their final model. We'll come back to that in a moment. And, uh, you know, there was a point where their bosses kind of were mad at them not working on their projects and they even got in trouble and told you can't be working on DNA in the daytime. Um, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta focus on your stuff, you know, graduate, you know, those kind of things, right? Um, but they just couldn't stop. They were obsessed with it. And they were, you know, meeting the right people at the right time. Um, and uh, so, what they did, they started doing some modeling and they started to uh, make some observations around DNA and they wanted to kind of crack it. They wanted to crack this. And they, there were some things that came up that really helped them figure out how, uh, how DNA was built. So one thing was uh, somewhere along there, I mentioned that uh, Rosalind Franklin was working with, uh, she was in the, in the laboratory of Maurice Wilkins. And at one point, Maurice Wilkins was talking to Watson and said, you know, Rosalind, uh, she made some nice photos. You want to see one? And uh, he didn't realize that Watson was still working on DNA and was technically a competitor. <laughs> uh, some people uh, are very angry at this, um, at, the, at history's treatment of Rosalind Franklin. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of different ways to read into it. You know, was he stealing her data? Um, not necessarily. Uh, it was offered freely, um, but uh, you know there, you can you can read about the history of it. It's super fascinating. But anyway, let's get back to the uh, the data here. So I'm not in an X-ray uh, crystallography expert, um, but there's a few things that Watson realized when he saw this image because Watson happened to know about a lot about crystallography, and here's some things he learned. One, the width of DNA. The width is a very crucial thing. If you're trying to figure out a molecule, knowing the exact size of it is important. Uh, something else is the phosphate. So you can see all this dark stuff on the outside, right? So if you take a look at DNA, right? DNA has carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and phosphorus. The phosphorus is, um, you know, all these other ones are kind of like uh, higher up on the periodic table. They don't have a lot of electrons, but phosphorus is a lot heavier. It's electron dense. So remember our electron uh, microscopy, anything electron dense is gonna show up a little bit better. And so uh, it does. Uh, and the other thing, I don't really know why, but uh, this particular image shows that uh, there's a helical structure. Uh, again, I don't quite understand that, but he, he realized that right away. And so these were some inspirations for their, their model making. And they realized that uh, there's a lot of information here and uh, they can probably, and they did, uh, they figured they could probably build an accurate model of DNA uh, using some of the information they learned over the years. So what is some of the information they use? Like I said, the molecular dimensions and the width. And so when they were putting DNA together, um, there were people all over the world working on DNA. A very famous American was putting, uh, trying to put DNA together and he was trying to make some sort of triple stranded structure. And uh, I can't remember why they, they uh, settled on two strands, um, but uh, they, they realize that the phosphates are negatively charged and you can't just shove them all together. So they put the phosphates on the outside of the DNA structure. And that left all these nitrogen spaces on the inside. If you take a look at this, if you, uh, if you put two purines together, it's too wide to match the crystallography image. If you put two pyrimidines together, uh, it's too narrow. But what if you put one purine and one pyrimidine? Uh, that is consistent with the data. So that's good. Uh, and, uh, and consistent with that, that X-ray crystallography data. So, uh, you know, when science is consistent, that's great. It means you're probably possibly on the right path. So, um, you know, somewhere along there, uh, one of them remembered 
Chargaff's rules, right? Remember, you know, uh, the purines and the pyrimidines uh, equal up, and the A's seem to be equivalent in terms of numbers to the T's and the G's and the C's. And so let's take a closer look at these A and T and G and C structures. And so what they realized um, was that if you pair up adenine with thymine, um, these things line up perfectly to get two hydrogen bonds, one there and one there. Incredible. And if you line up guanine and cytosine, you get three hydrogen bonds and it lines up perfect. Like you can't get much more perfect than this. It was really incredible how well uh, these things um, lined up together. So they're like, okay, we'll make our structure. We'll pair A with T and G with C. Um, they, um, they put together this structure. Uh, there's a photo of their, their model. And um, remember the part of it being helical. It turns out this whole thing kind of just fits together a little bit better if you give it a little bit of a twist to it, right? Uh, otherwise, if you stretch things out, uh, things aren't lining up quite right. But if, if you have a little bit of a helical twist to it, the DNA model uh, works out really well. So I know, you know, maybe this is how it happened. Instead, you can see he's in, in the bar and says, I'll have a double helix. Um, so there's a cute little joke there. Um, or maybe it happens something like this. And here, there's, uh, uh, there's Watson, he's, he's American. So he says, I say, old chap, I suspect DNA may be a double helix. Now, um, Crick was British and he would say, good shot, Watson, I think we've got it. So, and, and they did, right? Um, so there's, um, there's Crick's, uh, Crick's wife actually uh, drew this image. They published a paper in 1953. It was two whole pages, very short for a scientific paper but it crammed all this information in there. And this is one of these things where when they described what they thought was the structure of DNA, the rest of the world said, this is so, everything is so logical. It's so beautiful. It must be true. Obviously people, you know, went and did more studies on this, but uh, most people were convinced almost immediately because it made so much sense. They put together all this data without doing a single experiment themselves and, um, and eventually got Nobel prizes out of it as well. Um, so I just wanted to point out a couple other uh, features around the structure, right? So you can see uh, on the left, there's the helix, and you see the G's and the C's pairing, and the A's and the T's. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is uh, if you take a look, I'm going to, uh, at the structure in the middle, right? I'm just looking at this part on the left, okay? So notice um, that uh, that is in one direction, and uh, we've got, um, we've got uh, these uh, um, carbohydrates. Uh, I'll talk about this five prime end in a second. And the other side here is upside down compared to the first side. So this has a name. The structure is anti-parallel. And that means that one strand of DNA runs chemically kind of opposite to the other one. So let me just draw you a little mini structure showing you what we're talking about when we say five prime and three prime. Okay, so here's the structure of a deoxyribose. It looks something like this. So they're going to have an nitrogenous base up here and uh, down over here it's going to be connected to a phosphate and then up over here you've got another carbon. So that's uh, carbon number five and then that's connected to another phosphate. So sorry that's kind of crammed in there. Didn't realize I had a lot of space. So you know in chemistry um, often you know we want to, we want, are we talking about carbon number one, carbon number two, so you, you number your carbons, and there's a way to number the carbons, and they're numbered like this. One, two, three, three, four, and five. So we have five carbons, right? And, uh, you know, what if I was talking about carbon number three? Am I talking about carbon number three on the nitrogen space, or am I talking about carbon number three on the, uh, on the sugar? So what they do is they give these a little tick beside it, so it's like that. One prime, and the tick is called a prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. So now, uh, what does five prime mean? Five prime means we're talking about carbon number five. Three prime means we're talking about carbon number three. So if you take a look at, uh, if you take a look at your, um, the structure there in the middle, uh, the one on the left, uh, we're going from carbon five, four, and three five, four, and three, and so on. So we say that the one on the left runs from the five prime to three prime direction, and the one on the other side runs from the three prime to five prime direction. So they're opposite, they're anti-parallel to one another. So that is, uh, 
That is the DNA structure. So I'm just gonna stop share here for a second. And uh, I had promised I was gonna go back to my tie and uh, show you my tie here. So take a look at my tie. So I'll tell you, this tie has a story. I, uh, you know, was on eBay one day and uh, DNA tie, $7, buy it now, boom, right? Um, you know, within seconds I'd made a transaction and uh, $7, and a few weeks later in the mail, I get, hey, a DNA tie. Hey, this is really exciting. I open it up, and I'm like, that's not DNA. What is that molecule, right? It's just some sort of artisty, squirrely, whirly thing, honestly. I'm a biochemist by training. Um, I've looked at this many times over, and, and uh, I've, I've concluded that they're not actually trying to build anything, any known molecule known to anybody. Uh, they just put a bunch of colored balls and attach them by sticks and put a swirly around and call it a DNA tie. So ever see somebody with a DNA tie that looks like this, you can laugh at them and know that it's not a real DNA tie. Um, and uh, anyway, so $7 and it's good for, you know, one, one good joke a semester. So hopefully you like my tie. Um, it's fun to wear. And, uh, you know, when you talk about DNA structure, you can start to learn that, hey, okay, wait a sec, that is not actual DNA structure. So uh, a few more things to talk about here uh, regarding DNA. Uh, oh yeah, uh, back to Watson and Crick. By the way, if you're interested in their story, I, I really encourage you to check out this book. Um, I, it's one of these books, I, uh, it's like 120 pages. I pick it up and read it maybe once every five or six years. Uh, it's a great read. Uh, it's, it's all about, um, I don't, it has so much in it. It's, it's a great nonfiction book. You've got kind of the thrill of, of being a scientist in the 1950s. Um, Watson's a little gossipy. He didn't like Rosalind Franklin very much and she didn't like him very much. And, and so, you know, he's, he's not necessarily kind to her, which is, you know, a lot of people criticize that very heavily. Um, but uh, it, it's fascinating and, and there's science in there too. So it's got the best of all worlds, right? And, uh, you know, in the end, they figure out the structure of DNA. And uh, like I said, they, uh, they determine a lot of things that, uh, uh, made them very famous, and uh, they end up getting sharing a Nobel Prize along with Maurice Wilkins. Probably Franklin would have had the Nobel Prize instead of uh, Wilkins, but unfortunately she had uh, um, died of cancer. She was doing x-ray crystallography, and she probably got cancer from too much exposure to x-rays. Apparently she would never wear lead, uh, and so that was, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, I guess we'll never know. Uh, Apparently there's a movie with Jeff Goldblum. Um, you know, great actor, but I've not seen this movie and boy, it looks awful. But uh, you know, if you check it out, let me know. <laughs> um, uh, Crick also wrote a, a, a book. Um, he kind of has one chapter on the discovery of the structure of DNA. He talks about a lot of other things he was involved in. I have not read that one. If you do check it out, let me know. I wouldn't mind uh, knowing if it's a good read or not. So uh, something else that they talked about um, is they talked about uh, in their paper, and then they elaborated on this in a later paper, uh, that if you take a look at the structure of DNA, it suggests a possible mechanism for, for copying, right? So what do I mean by that? So like I said, if you take a look at one strand of DNA, you know, you can see that one there, we have A, T, C, A, and so on. Uh, if you know what one strand is, then you automatically know what the other strand is because it's complementary. So if there's an A on one strand, you know the other strand has a T and so on. So they figured that, you know, maybe this is how DNA copies, right? The two strands are going to separate. And then what's going to happen is uh, new DNA is going to come in and the new DNA uh, nucleotides are going to be complementary to the, uh, the parent nucleotides. So there we go. They're all coming in. So of course, uh, you can't just say things like this. Uh, you know, scientists want to see if it's, uh, you know, they want to try to prove this kind of hypothesis. And uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about now is uh, how, how that was done. And I'm gonna, gonna have to draw something for you again. Um, but uh, these were kind of the three possibilities um, that scientists were proposing at the time uh, shortly after Watson and Crick. So you can see the three possibilities, a semi-conservative model where the parent strands separate and new daughter strands are made. Um, some people suggest a conservative model, meaning the parent strand is never uh, broken apart. And then there was sort of this blended model called a dispersive model. So what I wanna do now is uh, I'm going to uh, exit out of this and I want to um, 
I want to draw something for you. So I just need to pull up the whiteboard. Uh, where's the whiteboard? There it is. And I uh, want to draw uh, a little something for you that's describing um, the next experiment. I have some slides on it, but it's a lot easier if you kind of go through it slowly. So I just have to find Zoom now and share my whiteboard with you. There's my whiteboard. Okay, so um, one second here. Okay, hopefully you can see the whiteboard. And I'll zoom in here a little bit. So these are the two guys who did this experiment. Messelson and Stahl. Uh, there were a couple of Americans and um, they were using radioactive DNA. So all these scientists love to use radionucleotides. Uh, lots of fun there, I can tell you. Um, certainly some risk. So here's, here's what they're doing. Let's just think about DNA and, uh, and what's going on here. So they, they were starting off with, um, with some uh, uh, radio, radio labeled uh, DNA. So they're using nitrogen 15. So we'll call this nitrogen 15, like that. And um, so I don't know what I just did, why that square went there. Okay, never mind. there we go. So there's one strand of DNA, and there's another strand of DNA. Okay, so I'm just going to draw it like that. And zoom out slightly. And then what they did, um, so you grow up some, I think it was just bacteria. A lot of things are done in E. coli. And then you, um, you swap it to media containing nitrogen-14. So I'll do nitrogen-14 in blue, like that. So if you think about this strand here, it has nitrogen-15. So we're going to call it heavy. So meaning it's heavier than nitrogen-14. So it turns out, and like I said, we know how DNA is replicated now, so I'm going to draw it in the proper way how, how DNA is properly replicated, but your strands are going to separate, right? So there's my strand, nitrogen-15 strand. Okay, and there's my DNA, so like that. And what I'll do is I'll, I'm actually going to draw you an extra step just so we can do everything one, one piece at a time. So maybe what I will do is erase that and put it over here, because I haven't added the nitrogen-14 yet. And then you have uh, your parent strands. So here's my parent strand with nitrogen-15, my other parent strand with nitrogen-15, right here. Okay, and then you're gonna have a nitrogen-14 strand, right? So there we go. There's the daughter strand and a second nitrogen-14 daughter strand. So notice at this point, um, I'm going to call these ones here medium. Okay, so in, what do I mean by medium? They're medium in density or medium in, in molecular mass because you have a combination of nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15. So let me shrink this, and I'm going to go through one more round of replication using nitrogen-14. So here we go. Add my nitrogen-14 to the media. I'm not going to throw in the step where I'm separating out the, um, separating out the strands, okay? I'm, I'm just going to draw the final result. So take a look at this. Here now we have a, a, an, um, a hybrid of nitrogen-14 and 15, and another hybrid of nitrogen-15 and 14, right? And so you're going to end up with uh, four parent strands. They're going to look like this. So there's nitrogen 15 and nitrogen 14. And the next one's nitrogen 15. I'll make this just a tiny bit. Got to squeeze one more in. Okay, and nitrogen 14. There we go. And all the uh, new daughter strands are going to be nitrogen-14. So let's draw those in. So nitrogen-14 here. Nitrogen-14 here. Nitrogen-14 here. Hopefully you can read all that. Like I said, if you ever want one of these diagrams, I can always email it to you. I think there's a way to export it from this uh, whiteboard as a JPEG. Okay, so let's just take a look at what we have here. Um, so this one here is going to be medium. 
This one here is all nitrogen 14, so it's going to be light. This one here is going to be medium. And the last one is going to be light. Okay, so that's great um, and wonderful. And so I know you're probably thinking at this point, wouldn't it be nice if we had a method that we could measure the mass or the density or something of DNA to confirm that this is exactly what is happening? And that is what Masselson and Stahl actually did. They did have a method for it. Uh, they were using something, something called uh, density gradient centrifugation. So I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, so hopefully you got that. If not, like I said, you can request the image or go back to the, um, uh, the video. And uh, let me just uh, pull this up and uh, I'll show you their experiment. Like I said, the pictures from the textbook. Just one of those things, a little bit easier to kind of, if you, if you go through step by step, it makes a lot more sense. When you look at the image, it's just it, so much information is there. So here's kind of what I was telling you. They start out with nitrogen 14 or 15, and they swapped to nitrogen 14. And then they were analyzing the DNA at each step using this uh, density gradient centrifugation. So these, uh, these centrifuges here are uh, expensive. And uh, they use um, these things called swinging buckets, and they spin things at, uh, oh, I don't know what it is, something like 60,000 RPM, and you can get up to 100,000 times uh, the g-force of gravity. And so when you, get up to, uh, when you get up to speeds like that, if you have chemicals in there, so in this case they're using cesium chloride, uh, the chemicals in the test tube actually start making a gradient. So near the bottom of the test tube, it's, um, there's more chemical right, it's a higher concentration than at the, the top. And so uh, what you have in the test tube is a gradient of densities. And so you can see in this case here, what they're trying to show you is you're getting different DNA samples, right, um, that are separating out by densities. So let's take a look at what they got here, right? And I might flip back to my image here in a minute. Actually, maybe I'll flip back to my image uh, right now and just take a quick look. So notice here in the first step, right? In the first step, there's one type. In the second step, there's one type. And in the last step, there is two types, medium and light. So this is what you're looking for. You're looking for a pattern, right? And you'd get different patterns if you had different models of, um, if you had different models of replication, right? So here's, here's what happened, okay? Um, they, they, did their, uh, they did their experiment, and after the first replication, they got one band. So by first replication, um, they're looking at, at this one here after the first round of replication. They didn't do it with the initial ones, right? And then over here, this is the second round with two bands. So take a look at their diagram. You can see after the first round, they ended up with one band. And after the second round, they ended up with two bands, a more dense and a less dense one. So that's going to be the medium and the light uh, that I referred to in my diagram. So let's just, just think about these other particular models, right? If you had the conservative model, it means the parent DNA is never touched. Uh, it's never um, um, separated. And so you'd always have two bands. You'd have the parent DNA and the, and the, and the uh, daughter DNA. But that's not what they observed. They observed one band in the first round and two bands in the second round. If you have the semi-conservative model, which is the true model, uh, then you're going to have one band and two bands. If you have a dispersive model, you're going to have um, um, all this mixing and matching, and you're going to have with one band and one band. So they concluded that yes, indeed, the semi-conservative model was in fact how DNA is replicated. Okay, so we're, uh, we're almost at the end here. Um, so that was an introduction to DNA structure. And uh, the next few units, uh, we're going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about uh, three processes. We're gonna be talking about replication, transcription, and translation. And I'm gonna repeat those words like 100 times because your final exam is gonna be very, very heavily uh, tested on those three concepts, replication, transcription, translation. Uh, and I'm gonna give you lots of hints. I'm gonna give you lots of promises about what's on the final exam. Um, so hopefully, uh, you know, you, as I give those hints or promises, you're gonna write things down so that you'll know what to study for, okay? And uh, we'll have some, some problems that we're going to uh, go through uh, in learning how to do these. So this is just mentioning that the, the next topic is DNA replication. So we just learned a little bit about the history behind it. And uh, so next topic, we're, we're going to look at the details of uh, DNA replication. And um, that's going to involve a handful of different enzymes and proteins that are involved in the process.
and, uh, and a few other things. So I think that is it for this topic. So done a few minutes early. Hopefully you enjoyed the lecture. I find this, um, uh, the history of scientific discovery uh, is something that I find uh, super fascinating. Um, so that's the end for today. Uh, hopefully everyone is relaxed. Maybe I'll say one more thing about the midterm is, no, I have not looked at it yet. I was just finished marking another midterm for another class. Uh, so I'm hoping to start looking at it uh, maybe tomorrow. And uh, I'm not making any promises, but my goal is to have it graded by Friday's class and we'll, we'll take it up uh, at the beginning of Friday's class. That is my goal. That is not a promise, but uh, hopefully I will be on track to do so. So have a wonderful Wednesday. I will see you on Friday.